Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, my LED install is completed, at least phase one. And what we're going to do today is take a look at the actual physical install, what the pieces were, how it all went together. Uh, and truthfully, it's actually in the shot right now, but you can't really see it because the way that I installed it came out much better than I anticipated. And it's actually right up there under the roof gutter. So come along with me, I'm gonna show you how I put it together. We'll kind of tour the entire install from the control center all the way out to the lights, talk about the pieces, what we learned, and uh, go from there. So we're gonna start off this discussion indoors, and we're going to talk about the uh, brain or the control center for the lighting display that I have. And I'm gonna just warn you that uh, this is a little over-engineered just because of the way my brain works. Um, so don't get overwhelmed. I'm gonna walk you through each piece of this. This is the control center that is mounted on the wall of my garage. And I've taken it off the wall and brought it inside so that we can discuss it a little bit cleaner. Um, and you can see essentially what this is, is the same thing I was discussing in the planning video. I haven't made any changes to this. I've just put it onto a piece of scrap wood that I had in the garage and kind of got everything connected down so that it's a little bit easier to maintain if I have to swap out a power supply, say. Let's just pull these wires, pull off a couple screws, pop it out, pop it back in. Uh, everything is pretty user-friendly from a maintenance standpoint. So walking through this then, uh, at the start we have two ESP8266 controllers. I'm running a separate controller for the peaks from the roof line. Those are powered via these little down converters, which are then hooked into power supply number one. So if we look at this from a standpoint of power, power supply number one, as we talked about from the planning video, powers both down converters and controllers, and then also powers the peaks. My roof peaks only required a single spot. I don't have any injection needs, so it's easier just to keep everything nice and isolated. So this is my controller for the peaks. Uh, this is the power supply for the peaks and for the secondary controller. Secondary controller then goes to the roof line. So you can see I've got my data and ground connected over here. Uh, all of my feeds coming in off of the roof kind of come down the wall and get hooked in right along here so everything's nice and tight and contained. Eventually, I'm going to build a box around this. Um, I just haven't gotten to that yet. So, controller 2 is an 8266 as well. Uh, that goes to the roof line, and then I have three independent power lines uh, run for the roof as well. Those come down here along the side and connect into power supply number 2. The only other thing on this board then are the feeds for the two power supplies. So these kind of higher gauge cables come over here and my main source uh, input voltage is done right here and then that splits out to the power supplies. All the wiring internally and all the wiring on the roof is 18 gauge except for these lines uh, from my source power into the power supplies themselves. Those are 14 gauge. For cable management on the board itself, I'm using a series of these pocket hole screws. What I really like about these is they're only threaded about halfway up. So sinking them in just to the end of the threads gives me this nice smooth line that I can run my cables around without worrying about punctures. And that lets me route my cords around the power supplies and keep a nice uh, kind of clean wiring presentation. Quick note too about the way the controllers are set up. Uh, these control boards are sitting on these little breakout boards. Uh, you can get these on Amazon as well. I'll post a link down in the description. It just makes it a little bit easier to wire. And then the breakout board is actually what gets attached uh, to my panel so the circuit can come out, be swapped or upgraded, uh, get the firmware flashed, do all of that kind of thing. Now the breakout boards I have are actually a little bit too small for the boards, but one row lines up. So my single row on the outside lines up, and that's all I really need since both of the data connections and ground connections I need are off of this side of the circuit. So it works just fine. From each of these controllers, then I'm running both a data line off of port D4 and a ground connection. So I used different, I used just little thin breadboard wires because it was simpler. I used different wires uh, from a coloring standpoint to be able to tell them apart. So green is my data wire from controller one, blue is my ground from controller one, and you can see both of those feed into the peaks. Here's my data, my ground, and my power. And then for controller two, I'm using the yellow and kind of this light gray. 
So yellow feeds over to what is the data for the roof line, and then this light gray feeds over to the ground. As I mentioned in the planning video, it is important that you are on a common ground between your controllers and your power supplies. So this ground wire grounds me out via this cable to this power supply, and this ground wire on my second controller grounds me out via these cables into this power supply. So I'm on the same power supply ground as the actual lights on the roof. That way the signal is going to go across and we're gonna be able to talk nicely to the actual strings themselves. So I apologize for the mess, but this is my control box as it's installed on the wall of my garage. Now, as I mentioned before, I am going to put a uh, kind of nicer cover over this at some point, probably in the spring, just to keep it protected. We don't usually store much on this upper shelf, so I'm not overly worried about it. But you can see how I've got my power coming in from the bottom here. Then I have my runs from the various lights and power injection points uh, coming in out of the ceiling of my attic, my garage, and then coming down. So this first connection on the left here, that's the roof peaks. That comes up here into the service loop, comes out, goes up through that hole, up into the attic, and then comes out in the front. Then the secondary line here, that one actually goes up and goes through the attic over there and comes out about right there in the corner. And then I've got my various power points. One of these power plugs runs that way. The other one runs out that way. Now I have a power injection point that I want to do right there, but I don't have an easy way from the attic to get out into the soffits. So what I ended up doing for that is running that power injection point up and out and along with this secondary data wire. So it actually comes out in that corner of my garage and it runs behind the existing lights up around the corner to get to here. Now, as I mentioned in the planning video, the other power point that I needed to be able to connect that I can get to from the attic of my garage is right about there. And because I needed a power connection point there, that's actually where I start my install. So I'm gonna go outside and show this, but my lights actually began there and worked their way along the side of the garage and this way so that I knew I would have an end point on the light string with a set of injection wires that I could connect into easily. This corner then is where my lighting install began. So there's a hole right here in the soffit and the data wire and power for this light comes out of there. The extension for my roof peaks also comes out of here and goes that way. And then a power connection for this line is fed from there as well. So a bunch of things happened from that corner. What that meant is uh, this string of lights was installed intentionally backwards. So the um, arrow of data travel was pointing this way so that the end of it would end up here. And the beginning of it then ended up on the other side of the garage. So I didn't really care where it ended on the side of the garage. So I worked it backwards from here, got to the corner, and then did a splice wire, which you can kind of see sticking there in the end of the little channels, because I haven't capped these yet and then went all the way down along the garage, installing backwards as I went. Again, did a corner splice. Uh, that's actually my second power injection point underneath that piece of conduit, and I'll let you see that up a little closer. I don't exactly like how I did that. Uh, it's only temporary. Once it gets to warmer temperature, you can see the snow falling right now. I'll probably redo that. So it goes then along the edge of the garage, around the corner and then down that side until it ended. And that's where I made my, uh, my hole essentially so that I could run the source for this main line and the main power point out of the end. So those come out of the side of my garage right there and then come across and tuck into the end of the conduit and then across and in. Now, none of that's been sealed up yet. You can kind of see the very end of it still exposed there. I am going to close all of that in uh, with some heat shrink wrapping, and then I'm closing all of the holes up with some tan um, silicone caulk, caulk just to make sure that no moisture or bugs or anything else get in there. But uh, it's installed and working, and that was the goal before it got cold. For the peaks, there's a small hole that comes out of the side of the garage right here in the corner, and the wire actually feeds out of there from the control box, which is about right there. It then runs up through the peaks and then back into the garage. And then I ran it through the ceiling of the garage, brought it back out 
here, ran it behind this conduit until we got about even with that corner of the peak. And then it actually comes up behind my rain gutter and then comes out. And the only part of it I don't like that I'm gonna change eventually is there's a small section of wire that you can see right there that connects up to the peak. So that's the data and power wire that runs up into that soffit, sneaks up underneath, and then connects into the end of that channel. And that's what provides the signal and the power for that half of the secondary peak. I wish that wasn't exposed. I'll probably look to move that in the spring as well. Um, I have connectors on there that I can disconnect height hidden up in the soffit. So I have some ability to maintain this as we go. Now I also decided as I was installing this not to deal with this side of my house, at least at this point. So I have an end on uh, this light strip. It does end gracefully there. I didn't cut that end off. So I can extend it if I want to, but initially uh, this side of the house isn't really visible from anywhere and I didn't want to take the time to do it. So now that we've talked about the actual install and kind of uh, done a tour of how it looks on the house, I want to talk about some of the specific pieces. So everything that I did as far as LED strips are contained within conduits. And those conduits are forming of kind of two different styles. There's a flat one like this, so you can kind of see the and presentation. This is what I used up in the peaks and kind of along the long side of the house. Um, they're very tight to the house. The lights are actually very bright through them. There's a diffuser that snaps into the outside. Um, and I use those everywhere where I could kind of get away with that really tight uh, layout. Now on the front roof line, I wanted the lights to be more kind of out and down. So for that one, I used this corner conduit it's a 45 degree kind of bent one. And the way this works is this gets attached to the house and then the light strip actually uh, is exactly the right size to stick directly onto this surface here. And then there's a uh, diffuser that clicks onto the outside. Now the way these actually mount to the house are through little brackets. Uh, and I've got this to kind of show you how that works. Just to make my life a little bit easier because I want to do this standing on a ladder in the middle of the night. I have a couple of the brackets that we use for the conduit. So these are the for the 45 degree and these are the flat. And for any of these, uh, the style of install is pretty much the same. There's a hole in the center. You just run a little sheet metal screw into your soffit or into your fascia. And then the conduits actually snap in. So kind of align one side, push it over and then click down and they snap into place. Now then the diffusers, after you put your lights inside and deal with all of that, just click on top and you get this nice tight presentation. Now with the corner ones, they're a little bit different, but they're close to the same. Um, you end up kind of putting the bottom edge in first and then snapping them up and you'll hear them click and then those will hold nice and straight. Now it doesn't matter if these are super tight to the house because the process of clicking them in actually flexes the connector itself and it'll end up with a nice kind of uh, clean, firm presentation when you're done. Now to actually install these corner ones, I want it to be really tight up against the rain gutters. So what I did is I took one of these and I put the bracket on the back, marked the spot and drilled my pilot hole. And then I used this as my guide. So placing this up against the house, flat up against the gutter. So I knew where to drill the pilot holes for each of the brackets that was going to actually mount these. Now as a tip too with these, uh, the diffuser clicks across the top and the diffusers are the same length as the pieces. So about 30 inches or so. What I would recommend that you do when you install the diffusers is take your first diffuser and cut it. So cut it a little bit short uh, or cut it in half, if you will, so that the seams on the diffusers don't line up with the seams on the channel. What that's going to let you do is accommodate for um, some kind of wonky installs. If you're not exactly perfectly straight or if you have little gaps, the diffuser is going to bridge across that gap and it's going to give you a much straighter final appearance when it's all said and done. And this is the diffuser. It's just a uh, kind of a frosted white material. And like I said, it clicks into one side like this. So you kind of snap the one side in and then flex it and it'll snap in on the top and then you just run your finger down the side and it'll click in down the line. So if I had this going across these two, 
when I had everything snapped in, you'd have a nice clean line. You wouldn't even know there was a seam here. That's pretty much it for the tour of the physical install. Um, I'm gonna do a few videos in the next several days about the initial setup uh, flashing install and configuration of the controller. So we'll talk about that, talk about some of the light patterns that I've found that I enjoy with the WLED software. Um, I'll also do a few just sort of lessons learned, uh, shorter things. I don't want this to, to go on too long. So I'm gonna cut it at this point. But there'll be some more content about this. And then as we get closer to Christmas and I experiment more with the software, uh, we'll do a few more uh, advanced setup configuration, what's possible type videos as we go along. But this being the end of a DIY dad uh, video, I owe you a dad joke. So given that it's winter and all of that, uh, what is one thing that often falls in winter but never gets hurt? Snow. All right, remember with any DIY project, the most important thing is just to do it. Nobody's gonna see the flaws unless you point them out to them. Uh, stay warm, have a great holiday. Those of you attempting the project, remember, Go slow, be optimistic, and we'll catch you on the next video. Take care.